presenting the result is born out of a pilot study that was carried out in 2010 in Lagos, Nigeria. We we'll say that Lagos is one of the fastest growing nation, I mean city in the world. <laughs> and uh, if there's going to be any fashion that will be accepted or rejected, it starts from Lagos when you talk of Nigeria. So we found that we have tradition, we have culture, and uh, there is no individual that will say he or she is worthy to live if you, are, you have decided to throw away your tradition or your culture. So we found that among the southwestern people in Nigeria, there is a culture of clothing and textile. And particularly, there is a technology of textile production through the weaving of Asho Ufi. Uh, I want to, there are some technical words. We say clothing. Clothing, according to Hans and Gruel, 1980, is a synonym that embraces dresses, apparels, coverings, all forms of appearance modifications that you can make to the human figure to prevent nudity is clothing. If I decide to put on a scarf and it covers only the frontage of my figure, I'm putting on a form of clothing. So, if for spiritual reasons, people decide to go off food. Because clothing is the third among the four basic needs for a human being to survive. Right? We talk of food, shelter, clothing, then health. It's not even, you don't need to be educated for you to live. It's not fundamental. So if this number three among the basic needs for living uh, becomes a subject of discourse like we're having today, I think it is worth it. If you and I decide to go off food, and we decide to leave our homes and go to the seaside for as long as we choose, it's still okay. But there is nobody that can do without clothing. Even in your bedroom, you have your nightgown, you have your beddings covered with clothing. So it is very, very essential. So we looked at this and found that in our culture and tradition in Yoruba part of Nigeria, we have a culture of clothing, we have a technology of local clothing production through weaving. And the, weave, uh, the, the equipment we use, the loom, is the apparatus or equipment used for weaving. We have our local loom, which is called Ofi. So the word Asho means cloth or textile. So Asho Ofi means the textile that is produced from Ofi. And now we come to ICT. We are all aware we have information tech. Uh, communication technology. That's the reason I have something pinned onto me. I can look at something on the board. That's the reason you and I can decide to put this off or put it on. Then the Yoruba. The Yoruba is a race in Nigeria that cuts across seven states, basically. And we have some remnants of Yoruba in Benin Republic, some in Ghana, Sierra Leone, and all the stuff. The Yoruba people, according to the 1999 census, form about one third of the total population of Nigeria. And now, Asha Ufi, there are basically three types of Asha Ufi. We have the Etu, like you have on the upper part of that slide. The next one is the Alari, and the third is the Sion. The Etu is blue in color, and it is given its name after the Guinea fowl. Etu is available in different shades and tones of blue. The Alari is red in color given showing some, some elements of vivacity. And you have the cyan, which is beige in color. It could be dark, depending on the coloration given to it, as well as the manner of weaving and the amount of aesthetics the producer decides to introduce. So what is Ashofi used for? You will see somebody here going to a wedding. You see a couple there having their traditional marriage. You see another couple below holding the status of office for chieftaincy titles. And this is somebody 
Who was given an award sometime here in 2010 in Texas? That's Bessie. You see how they are dressed in the Yoruba show fee. So basically, these are the uses for a show fee, as we are. But we found from the study carried out by uh, the, those researchers in 2010, we found that there is what we call youth bulge. There is youth bulge, and there is Lagos at the center of what happens in Nigeria. So why are people in Lagos not using a show fee? Why are the youths not using a show fee? Should we allow this traditional textile to go into extinction? So those are the questions that this study went ahead to try to answer. So the problems are, a show fee was still produced on narrow looms. And the, 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 the production would be 15 cm, that's about seven inches wide. The production will be, the product will be heavy in weight and the textile also will be so heavy. These are some of the reasons the youth gave for not wearing a show fee, for functional use. In textile, we talk of functionality, that is what you wear every day. We are all here. Is it possible for us to be in a show fee? Our youth told us no, because it's too heavy, the textile is too heavy, even the production. And then we found that our weavers are experiencing what we call gross manpower on the utilization. Because the narrow strips will take to produ produce seven inches width will take the same time that we have, they have to throw in the shuttle in and out of the loom as many times as they will do. Whereas with the new loom that we introduced in this study, they will make as wide as 48 inches, which is the same width with the usual African prints. And now, we found that consumers don't accept a show fee for use because of reasons mentioned earlier on. And we found that there are a lot of our youths who are involved in cyber crimes. Why can't we divert their, you know, th th their progress in these cyber activities into something more useful that could want them self-reliance and employment and we can rid our societies of all these uh, crimes? Then we need to divide youth ICT knowledge into a show for women. We need to boost traditional technology and we need to improve skill acquisition for weavers. And now some research questions were raised. Which methods were used for UFI in southwestern Nigeria and how effective were they? Are there contemporary overhauling which are needed for improved methodology and to boost product quality? How can the expected improvement be injected within available local and contemporary technology? So the objective of the paper basically is to introduce new ideas into our shelf production technology so that it could meet contemporary needs of skill acquisition, production boost, self-reliance self and uh, job production for our youths. We went ahead to sample 36 master weavers and 144 trainees in weaving centers in Undo, Oyo, Isenyo, and Okure. Isenyo and Oyo, those of us who are familiar with Southwest, are the basic towns where Ashof is woven. But for social reasons, the Undo people are people who are so social, they have activities from Thursday to Sunday, it is one thing or the other and they make use of a show fee a lot. So there are pockets of weavers too. And with Ondo State Government and the Akure at the state capital, there is a sericulture center. If we need to go, time would not permit us to go into the history of weaving. We would have seen that actually the yarns used to weave the original a show fee is got from the cocoon of the silkworm, which is an anafe from the Bombix Mori species. So it's any people Usually, they are uh, uh, professional or historical producers of this uh, cocoon. So, on the state government, sometime in 1980, there was somebody who came from abroad to start up a wealth creation agency, Weka in Ondo State. So, this man studied in India, and he got government to sponsor many of our people to India to learn sericulture, so they could produce sick yarns for, to be used for the making of a show fee. So the sericultural center is in Akure. So the uh, interview schedule was used on these people considering their level of education. It contained items on their demography, what inspired them into weaving, what kind of training did they receive, and now how do they train their apprentices? What are the challenges they are facing, and how do they intend to boost 
their productivity. After all this had been done, we now went back to introduce ICT into how they could have their products. If you look at the ones I showed to you, the slides shown earlier on, you will see that there are basically some stripes. You see all these stripes, we call them irregular stripes. Because the spaces between them are not equal, you see that even the width of each stripe is not equal to the other. So we now brought technology by going to the computer to develop. Now we have a uh, computer generated design which were used in the study. The computer was able to generate this and give us their names. We also went ahead to use the kind of OV that Ondo State government had been able to produce for its weavers. This is called the wide loom. This is the one that will weave up to 48 inches, 124 centimeters, as against 15 centimeters from the local narrow loom. So these computer-generated designs were interpreted on the loom by helping our weavers to do that. It's what we call warping. Warping is the process whereby each thread is put into the needle of the loom. You say that about 6,000 single threads will be used on the warp before you start to throw in the weft yarn. So how would they do this? How would they do the count? These designs that were generated in the computer, this is a check design. This is a stripe. You see that each box here has each box in the first design the Easter purple check. Each box there contained 48 yarns. So it was possible to guide these weavers to do the warping according to what the computer has given us. We did the same thing for all the other three designs. And after this had been done, weaving commenced. And when weaving commenced, we now asked the weavers themselves to compare the product from the narrow loom with the product from the wide loom. And the results we had well, that's 64% of these weavers acquired their skills via apprenticeship method, and they used the same for their trainees. 36% of them could not source materials and facilities, so they still practice under their master's law, what you call joint man. So the master takes the bulk of the work and sublets to them for them to earn a living. And they now agreed that they would prefer to use the wide loom. So the conclusions were that warping, filling, and counts for wide loom was time and energy saving compared to narrow loom. Innovation for adequate utilization of weaver's manpower and production boost was achieved. And uh, the, 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 the products, the conclusions confirmed the position of Luke and Cat 2003 that product innovation creates new products, while process innovation reduces production cost. We also concluded that there are a lot of opportunities for entrepreneurship and poverty alleviation through improved actual fee recommendations. The study recommended that our weavers need to be retrained with incorporation of ICT through slides, compact discs, pictorial books, and handouts, hands-on, minds-on materials for them to improve on their expertise that our youth need to be integrated into agriculture through the cultivation of cotton, mulberry leaves. Those are the leaves that the sick cocoon filled on for them to produce silk yarn. And practice sericulture. Sericulture is silk production for self-reliance as they provide raw materials. So they will be doing this to provide raw materials for actual fee. And at the same time, they will become self-reliant and we can rid ourselves of embarrassment. Now, the study also recommended PPP, the private the public-private partnership synergy to procure equipment and grants for mass production and expansion for our shelf industry. We also recommended that there should be a ban on the importation of fabrics and second-hand clothing to encourage the consumption of our local content. Thank you very much for listening. The longest that I've ever read to public is five verses in the Bible. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I have a 14 pages. So if you clap, uh, you clap for Dr. Akonde. And then um, don't forget to clap for me for taking this time.
So her paper is on emergence of African independent churches in Nigeria and its impact on African diaspora, Christ Apostolic Church in focus. The abstract, emergence of, emergence of African independent churches in Nigeria could be dated back to 1909 when the charismatic Anglican cleric Garrick Sokari started his divine healing movement around the Niger area of Delta State in Nigeria. These are churches established by Africans for Africans on African soil. One of these is Christ Apostolic Church. Since Christianity responds to ever-changing circumstances or situation, the church also saw the need to respond to the spiritual and socio-political endeavor of African diaspora people seeking cultural and national identities. This paper, therefore, explores the status of churches in Nigeria before the emergence of African independent churches, the impact of the church on African diaspora, and the role of African diaspora on the social, economic, religious, and educational advancement of Nigeria, the original home. Metals employed to carry out this study include historical interview, visit to the library to collect relevant materials and observations. Findings reveal that the church which started with few members and branches in Nigeria has spread its tentacle to be one of the fastest growing assembly, not only at home, but also among African diaspora. It is therefore suggested among other that African diaspora should establish close contact with natives to play a significant role behind the scene to develop their continent and more importantly see themselves and come together abroad as Africans. By so doing, African diaspora is togetherness with others at home who have made positive impact and left indelible mark on the church and Nigeria in particular. I've been told to summarize this in five minutes. <laughs> That makes it even easier for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in five minutes, I'll read one page, will be the introduction, I'll read the conclusion. And if you have any questions afterward, please write them down, and put your contact, and I'll be glad to pass it forward. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the introduction, the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century witnessed a new era in history of Christianity in Africa. The new phenomenon was nothing but establishment of many African independent churches with series of coined names or applications. The rush for establishing this movement was as a result of people's misconceptions that Christianity was a white man's religion. Thus, since Christianity became rooted in Nigeria, the establishment, the establishment of these churches have been on the increase. African independent churches have been defined in different ways by different scholars. Parinda described them as a sect which have split away from or spring up in relative independence of the old mission churches. Osun, in his own understanding, gave the following exposition of the group and how their emergence on African soil has been so timely and welcome phenomena. The saying concerning them that this prophetic movement provided missing link to mention Christianity in Africa with both the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. I went further to affirm that they also serve as a catalyst to produce profound spiritual transformation in Africa. And above all, despite opposition, they have commendably provided examples of genuine African initiative in Christian mission, as well as authentic, vibrant, and bold experiences of Christianity with strong African imprint. The message today have been able to reshape humanity and become an attractive tool of gospel communication in one of the largest black population in the world. So I will accelerate to the conclusion. Okay. I hope I am being heard and heard clearly. All right, so conclusion, even though we haven't, but it says here we have examined this paper the meaning of African independent churches and factors responsible <laughs> for the emergence. We have also seen that the establishment of vibrant African independent churches with partic particular focus on Christ for the church have contributed immensely to the social, political, economic, religion lives of Africans. 
their presence in, the, in their new home has not made them to totally forget their country of origin. To them, home is home. If I say more, it will be passing <laughs> of my time. So I thank you for your time, and I will relay your questions <laughs> to Dr. Akande. Thank you very much. My paper today is on ethnoxenophobia, um, and um, I'll be exploring the paper, you know, in relation to cross-cultural conversations with politics of identity and ideation. Um, I'll just go straight to it. Uh, ethnoxenophobia. Sorry, I'm, I'm struggling with my system. Ethnoxenophobia has its root in twisted history. Experience of some sort uh, twisted around various versions of ideas over time. Ideas of, as stories, ideas as actions and inactions of people. Uh, ben Johnson defined ideation as a matter of generating, developing, and communicating ideas. However, although almost any experience we can think of as an ideological base, not all ideologies are productive. Undesirable ideologies stir up repressive agendas, and in order to ensure their social acceptance, they are passed off as natural ways of seeing things, instead of such being seen as mere ideologies. So you keep pressing and pushing on certain points of, you know, at people, and then they take it as what is supposed to be, and they take it as what ought, instead of, you know, it, 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 and the fact is it's repressive. So while addition may include the creation of original ideas, its primary focus is working through concepts to gain insight, understand implications, you get feasibility, and expose us to deeper understanding. That's communication. You say something, I understand it. I say mine, and then you understand it. Cross-fertilization of ideas. We can think of addition as a way of building to think, meaning that by the end of our journey through this paper today, we would all be challenged as members of the same interpreted community to think of ways out of our various degrees of xenophobia as a strong ideological weapon to repress. I, I, mean, I expect it to open us up to many possibilities of um, solving the hydra-headed Africa's ethnocenophobic tendencies while we ask the needed questions. Now to my thesis, there is a lack of substantial cultural correspondence between the peoples of Africa and the continent and in the diaspora. Despite the many cultural identities that we share, for instance, American Jews hold Jews from Israel as their brothers and sisters, vice versa. The Asian groups in North America also you know, have success stories in, in, in this relation, but um, this is not the case with Africa. And by this I mean as individuals, as an entity, for instance, Nigeria and Rwanda, you know, uh, uh, example is, is very copious. And um, they, these are two countries that belong to two different regions of the continent. And they experience the same kind of um, incidents that led them back, you know, to, 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 to the, to the um, um, you know, animalistic base uh, of, of man. And then in Nigeria, we had the civil war. In Rwanda, we had the genocide. And then um, in the case of Africans and Africans in the diaspora, we're like estranged distant relatives. It is often of more adversarial relationship than a coercive one. Africans are cynical of African Americans, and um, African Americans are suspicious, of Af uh, they're, they're suspicious of Africans. The manner at which we in Africa address African Americans is derogatory. Despite the fact that we cry foul when we are treated with, um, with disrespect by the whites, we play the race game. At a, you know, at a white antagonism, why we see no sin when we play the same game against the fellow black man? Xenophobia is a perception based on socially constructed images and ideas. It is never based on rational or ideological or, um, ideology. A xenophobic perception of the world re reduces complex social and cultural phenomena to simplistic good and bad. This is good, this is bad. That's what it does. To build our identities as individuals and members of a group, an ethnic group, a nation, whatever it is you want to say, implies becoming aware of the diversity in society and one's difference from another's, which is not negative in itself as long as 
diversity is not perceived as threatening and the recognition of these differences is not used for political manipulation. The other should be perceived first of all as a brother or sister or a fellow human, not as a foreigner, enemy, or rival. It should be noted that while in Eastern Europe, the main targets of xenophobia are likely to be members of the, members of the minority group. In many Western countries, the targets tend to be immigrants and um, refugees regardless of skin or color. There always used to be a xenophobia in Africa, as is evidenced by the long history of interethnic violence and tribal wars you know, on the continent. Exclusive ethnic identities are inventions of our political advocacies and relevances. Ribadu, uh, no Ribadu wrote that Nigeria was a stretch of land hosting many cities and cosmopolites. Where in the southwest, the Ijebus and the Egbas was, um, um, people didn't consider themselves as one. Even right now, if um, in the state of, I mean, Ogun State, we have the Egbas and we have the Ijebus. And the truth of the matter is, an Egba will say, I'm Egba man, and an Ijebu man will say, I'm an Ijebu man. You cannot say, an Egba man is an Ijebu. They, they're going to call you to other that. No, that is not it. And, you know, we are Yorubas. And um, it's even in the same state. So what we, nobody is saying here is that people didn't consider themselves as one, let alone as Yoruba. In the Southwest, it was a taboo to infer that the people of, say, Arochuku and Onicha were one. None accepted identification as Igbo. The Hausa land, too, was not monotonous as today's Hausa man from Kano and Katsina would rather identify with their cities than, um, than with any corporate uh, ethnicity. For instance, I cannot say that a Kaduna man is an Hausa man. He's it, it, not going to accept that. So um, foreigners were either driven away and killed or subjected by military means, and the surviving members, mostly women and children, assimilated into the society of the conquerors. The kingdom of Shaka and Dingan among the Zulus and the Moshesh among the southern Sothos were typical examples of this assertion. There are countless others in Nigeria, from the Agbekoyas to the Ogedeng Bays in the southern Nigeria, the Idia of um, Benin in the east, and the Amina of Zaria in the north. Another dimension of xenophobia was established during, I mean, through the colonizing of Africa. Western European countries targeted Africa to lay hold of large territories for the supply of raw materials and aid for their developing economy. We all have heard about all that, you know, in the course of this um, um, conference, so I, I don't want to beat that. Racial tension arose from this situation as the white rulers kept local blacks subjection to their victims and um, to their whims and caprices. The blacks stereotyped their experience by the perception of all whites as oppressors and exploiters. This strained relationship was followed by a long history of black confrontation. Um, Kamenshikov opines that attempts of authorities to address questions of interethnic relationships tend to be based on the concept that problems arise mainly as a result of a low level of understanding of each other's culture and tradition. This ignores the fact that ethnocultural solidarity in current realities for many has become an important factor in achieving social and economic success. He further states that people differ not only in culture and traditions, but in the typical social strategies that they apply to reach various social and economic objectives. Such strategies often contradict each other. Thus, dealing with this challenge requires better social integration, better confidence among the population in the intentions, in, in the intentions and capabilities of the state and development, na um, development nationwide values and principles. Uh, Daniel Posner makes two groundbreaking contributions in his institutions and ethnic politics in Africa. First, that the activation of a specific dimension of ethnicity is an important and researchable variable. And second, that change in institutional structure often triggers the activation of ethnic dimensions. If each individual has many ethnic identities, such as um, group ancestry, language, culture, religion, or territory, while the smaller identities are nested within these factors, for example, clan within an, um, an ancestral, uh, ancestral group, then why does one identity rather than another become the basis for political conflict? In developing the logic explaining why change in institution causes change in ethnic dimension, Posner focuses on group size. In a given institution, the choice of ethnic dimension depends on which one brings the voter into a group. 
larger enough to form a minimum winning coalition. He creates a valuable diagnostic tool that the notion of an ethnic identity matrix, for example, is either you identify as a member of one of over 120 tribes, in quote, sorry, in Nigeria, or member of one of its three principal language groups, which creates a problem. Theoretical expo uh, exploration, I, 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 I am going with um, the closure ch theory. And um, how can the theory of compromise and closure enhance our understanding of ethnocenophobia? Ethnic conflicts are modern state. The view from afar that these concepts generate when used for describing modern societies helps to overcome methodological nationalism and allows us to perceive what is usually hidden from the picture. The idea of what is, what ought to be, or the perception of the reality may not actually be, I mean, um, I, what's it called? Reality may not actually be what people actually um, feel it is, that, that kind of idea. Um, we can look at the Ife Mundakeke conflict in the southern part of Nigeria, the Northern Ireland and Welsh conflict before the devolution, the Hutus and the Tutsis in Rwanda are also examples of what this theory postulates. Ethno nationalist conflicts have outweighed all other forms of political confrontation. The intransigence of ethno nationalistic politics has led to catastrophe. Um, in Bosnia, Sri Lanka finds no more respite than does um, Burma, Interland, and southern um, Sudan. Wimmer lists a, lot, a total of 49 fields of ethnopolitical conflict from 1993 to 1994 alone. When the trend reached its peak, it has been argued repeatedly that the classical theory of modernity has a blind spot when it comes to understanding the rise of nation, state, nationalism, and ethnicity. Max Weber made a differentiation between the idea of open and closed relationships that is generally seen as a starting point of the theory of closure. An open relationship does not deny participation to anyone who wishes to join, whereas a relationship is defined as closed against outsiders so far as according to its subjective meaning and its binding rules. Participation of such persons is excluded, it's limited, or subjected to conditions. Closure is hence a process through which social groups maximize advantages by limiting access to privileges and life chances of selected persons. To achieve this aim, this is a monopolization of life chances and the definition of outsiders, practically any feature, you talk of language, race, class, gender, religion, etc., can be singled out. Although this definition appears to point to a general concept of closure, in its practical sense, Weber, um, in, his, in his work, discusses closure mainly in re reference to economic relationships. Here, usually one group of competitors takes some externally identifiable characteristics of another group. Um, as a pretext of attempting this, as a pretext of attempti uh, attempting this exclusion, and rather casually, he goes on to say that such group action of exclusion may provoke a corresponding reaction on the part of those whom it is directed. Nevertheless, Weber did not develop the concept of corresponding reactions as si systematically and as generally as his notion of closure. Um, contextual comparison. Africa is encountering many challenges. One of them includes the tendency of manipulating ethnic identities for private interest. And this is one of the reasons why Africa is the way it is today. We are, a lot of people have used the word progressing, but in what direction? Um, an illustration of this can be seen in Nigeria where the North has deliberately created a state of unrest in their own region because the president is not from the North. We can grasp the root cause of the prevailing ethnopolitical violence insofar as we take seriously the following questions. How ethnic identity relates to the conflict of loyalties and interest? Two, how dynamics of ethnic identities fashion the existing understanding of common good and political life? In search of long-term solutions to these questions, this paper investigates how ill-founded methodologies tend to sideline equal citizens, citizenship among citizens in favor of the model of exclusion founded upon ethnocentrism. The challenge of integrating cultural identities in the processes of political integration and democratization is closely related to the problematic concepts of nation state, citizenship, and um, common good. 
the paper uh sorry, the tendency to say state construction in terms of a zero sum goes um does not force tightening conviviality the, the genesis of this tendency has been traced back to the colonial state um and in conclusion this paper is not just one that raises the matter of our dysfunction ebony kinship but one that also investigates the matter of dysfunction di within and without the african continent i want to locate ethnocentrophobia in africa within and without political system in relation to governance and the economic growth of the countries in question. We examine how it reflects the roles and influence of ethnicity in the distribution of resources. In addition, shed more light in past, on past and present occurrences which define the pace of oppression and growth in the countries. I want us to explore the ways that we Africans distrust African Americans and create suspicion. African frustration with the Ebony Kings has, uh, has many roots and, I, I, and that I look at as a systemic problem that may never be resolved, despite the several scholarly publications in that area, until we raise the roof with our voices. We just have to keep talking about it. It is either we feel that we're exiles waiting to return home, or as those who have crossed to the other side and burnt the bridges. We must also ask the question whether there are any areas in which both parties could benefit from the experiences of the other. In open dialogue, stereotypes and fear might evaporate. African scholars tend to complain that African Americans have absorbed the white anthropological images of Africa and Africans. It could not be otherwise given the melting pot ideology and education patterns. Even the children of Africans have demonstrated this on many occasions. Um, I suggest that we intentionally create intellectual fora like this to discuss the cuts that bind. This would in, in, in involve doing serious research in African-American history and conditions. The new home in America has definitely reshaped us, created specific conditions and identity problems. They have to contend with a declining visibility and the loss of gains made during the civil rights era. Meanwhile, Latinos are taking over in many areas. As you can see in, in New York, in, in California, African-Americans African on this part I'm almost done. We conclude by asserting that peace in Africa is not the absence of war, but the acceptance of the realities, regardless of how ugly they are, and the provision of a home for the dispersed and a sense of belonging for other Africans that choose to make con the other continents their home. Thank you. Thank you very much. My paper is on cosmopolitan dilemma, diaspora, and postcolonial laminality. The construction of postcolonial identity as laminal state points to the ever shifting subje subjectivities that define the lives of subjects in the diaspora. Postcolonial subjects are in a transitional state, not knowing or fully belonging in spaces that constrains their self individuation and identity. Structural inequalities as it relates to race, gender, age, ethnicity, nationality, class, and language, and dominant hegemonic ideologies of the West continue to affect the ways in which postcolonial transitional subjects adapt and attempt to create a wall for themselves in the diaspora. I will examine Tejoko's open city to show how global racial hierarchies continue to negatively affect post-colonial subjects in metropolises of the West. I argue that the diaspora becomes a laminar space, a threshold where post-colonial subjects constantly remake their identities through movements and migrations, searching for space and place in thwarted metropolitan spaces of the West. Black diasporan scholars such as Carol Boyce Davis, Francois Leonet, and Ketu Karak, Anthony Abia, among others, have engaged in the discourse of displacement and the politics of relocation of migrant subjects and the complex search for cultural identity in different geographical spaces around the world. Abia Abli problematizes the concept of relocation that unequivocally shows the lack of the cosmopolitan spirit or what he calls the citizen of the universe, evident in subjects not fully belonging or being part of new communities in the West demonstrating that the diasporic African subjects are hardly fully members of the cities or metropolises of the West as they struggle to create a space for themselves within mainstream society. 
post-colonial subject search for the cosmopolitan spirit ends in futility. Abia in cosmopolitanism suggests a more inclusive environment where diversity is celebrated and the beliefs and values of others respected. Abia's notion of cosmopolitanism is that we have obligations that stretch beyond those to whom we are related by ties of kin and kind or even the former ties of a shared citizenship. The other idea is that we take seriously the value not just of human life, but of particular human lives, which makes taking an interest in the practices and beliefs that lend themselves significance. People are different. The cosmopolitan knows, and there is much to learn from our difference. Abia envisions a universal acceptance of the human diversity irrespective of race, gender, ethnicity, nationality, language, or location. Unfortunately, post-colonial African diasporic and transi transitional subjects do not fully belong in global spaces of the West. They remain outsider, outsiders at the trenches of society, struggling to make a life for themselves in hostile spaces. Therefore, the respect for diversity and call for a more inclusive environment proposed by Abia is a fact reaching cry from the gender racial hierarchies that negatively affect the lives of a race population in the diaspora. I argue that living within the borders of metropolitan spaces means a subject is physically, geographically, culturally, socially, and psychologically at the crossroads between myriad ideological and structural inequalities that thwart attempts for self-definition and agency. The borderland subjectivity of diasporic subject is shaped by the intersecting identity categories of race, class, gender, nationality, culture, freedom, and constraint as they must transform and reconfigure themselves in a multiplicity of shifting contexts in the diaspora. They constantly negotiate these intersecting discourses as they struggle to create a space for themselves in the metropolis. Being in the borders of society complicates the identity of diasporic subjects who are constantly in transit, never fully belonging anywhere. Therefore, the preferred space of existence is that shifting side of transition and movement which allows them to be fluid subjects and never pinned down by any prescribed hegemonic ideologies. Coal in open city effectively exemplifies the concept of laminality or in-betweenness through the documentation of the life of a post-colonial transitional subject wandering the streets of the metropolitan city of New York. The postmodern migration of the narrator, Julius, from Nigeria to New York in search for better economic opportunities leaves him wanting for more even after completing a medical degree and practicing as a psychiatrist. The narrator's intellectual capital does not guarantee inclusion in sociocultural spaces of the cosmopolis. He remains an outsider, developing a transitional identity, crisscrossing spaces and places in the city that remain strange and foreign to the aspirations of diasporic subjectivity and inclusiveness. The post-colonial subject navigates the metropolis from a position of marginality, constantly struggling to fit in through recreating and re reinventing his identity. Racial bias and cultural difference sets the narrator apart from mainstream society. His identity as it relates to his national origin, class, ethnicity, language, and migrant status all work negatively to cement the discrimi discrimination and estrangement faced in the metropolis. The lack of the cosmopolitanism spirit as envisioned by Abia pushes post-colonial diasporic subjects to function in laminar spaces as outsiders, constantly searching for agency. The movement from place to place across different parts of the metropolis epitomizes the alienation and psychological burden experienced by diasporic, diasporic subjects ex excluded from mainstream society. The narrator in Coast text undertakes walks every day from one part of the city of New York to another, wandering aimlessly and being enveloped in his own thoughts of hopelessness and loneliness in a populated metropolis where he neither belongs nor is a part of. He provides description of the scenery, the birds, and focuses more about nature than the people in the city. 
His focus on the environment more than the population of the city symbolizes the distance that exists between him and other subjects in the metropolis. His otherness is just opposed in opposition to a heavily normative race population. Subjects from different backgrounds occupy the same space but navigate the world within those spaces differently. As for a post subject like Julius in the text, the navigation of the metropolis is a long, lonely walk across spaces that seem familiar but strange at the same time. I just have to rush. I have two minutes here. Migrant subjects across national and international borders also echo the same desire to belong in new communities in the diaspora. Irrespective of cultural background, it is evident that immigrants in various parts of the world continue to fe feel a sense of rejection in diaspora communities. The narrator travels across national borders to Brussels and experiences the commonality of the diasporic experience. His conversation with a Moroccan immigrant, Farouk, captured the disappointment among diasporic subjects elsewhere. Farouk's disillusionment is evident when he says, when I was doing my undergraduate degree in Rabat, that is Morocco, I dreamed of Europe. We all did, my friends and I. Not America, about which we already had bad feelings, but Europe. But I have been disappointed. Europe only looks free. The dream was an aberration. Farrakh, like the narrators, share a sense of emptiness, and the idea of the diaspora being a self-heaven is only an illusion. Farrakh, like the narrator, envisions a world where all humans are can live freely and amicably, void of racial discrimination and structural inequalities that thwart progress for most immigrants. Farouk believes in Abia's idea of cosmopolitanism, where there is a respect for human diversity and different cultural values and beliefs. It is a vision shared by other immigrants like the narrator, but leaves many longing for a more equitable, just, and inclusive environment. Even maintaining a cosmopolitan spirit among black peoples of African descent is unachievable. Establishing a common consciousness, not in the sense of a common diasporic experience, but in the context of a shared displacement from the homeland Africa is unattainable. There is a clear intergroup division between communities of Africans and African descended peoples in the diaspora. Such estrangement at times leads to hostility and violence toward recent African immigrants. The narrator experiences such hostility as he is mercilessly beaten by a group of African-American youth. Violence against the narrator reiterates a tenuous relationship among African immigrants and peoples of African descent. There is no solidarity or progressive dialogue based on a common consciousness of a racialized displaced population in unsettling global spaces of the metropolises. Coal in open city captures the experience of post-colonial transitional subjects' existence in the diaspora. It is not a glorifying representation of a welcoming cosmopolitan spirit, but an environment of continuous struggle and adaptation by African diasporic subjects. There is a continuous movement and journey by diasporic subjects in metropolitan spaces, searching for agency in heavily racialized global spaces. One wonders if it were possible to achieve inclusiveness in metropolitan spaces as Abia proposes, proposes, or is it just a false reality? The narrator in Open City suggests that it is a difficult aspiration to achieve as he is constantly in flux with an ever-shifting and transitional identity, never fully belonging anywhere. Consequently, Cole's text must be read as a series of border crossing not a fixed or geographically or ethnically or nationally bound category of writing. Such a transitional and cross-cultural diasporic perspective redefines African post-colonial diasporic subjectivities away from fixed or unified identities to fluid and ever-shifting subjectivities where subjects are always in transit. Thus, migrant subjects must constantly negotiate the borderland space in order to define their subjectivities away from exclusion and cultural ambiguities as they move from the margins to the center of life in metropolitan spaces of the West. Thank you.
So here in the U.S., um, the prevailing rhetoric of the United States government or the American people is that we are a nation made up of immigrants. Um, that's the prevailing notion. But the reality is that um, for Africans living outside their countries of origin, the diaspora offers an alternative landscape that can feel secure and promising, as well as fragmented and precarious. So migra migration provokes deep social and cultural ruptures in the daily and long-term lives of diaspora people. Oh yes, I forgot that. So like I said, dominant narratives about immigrants in the United States offers very limited views about the daily lives of those immigrants. Um, so we, we tend to understand immigrants as two things. One, we tend to see them as wanting to integrate into the greater American society, wanting to move up the ladder, um, benefit from the so-called American dream. And then the other notion of immigrants that we have is that they are stubborn and resistant to change. They stick to their own communities. And they're closed off to joining the larger American society. But this is a very one-dimensional understanding of immigrants and diasporic people. And it's especially contradictory to, to the US's idea of like a united Im immigrant nation and a melting pot of diversity. Um, but within the past five years or so, there's been this discussion of Africa rising as a continent that's booming and developing. And this is mostly an economic conversation. But mainstream media outlets like CNN, The Economist, Time Magazine have been featuring successful African entrepreneurs who are contributing to the continent in different ways, mostly through business and innovation. Um, so we've, we've seen Africans in, in these kinds of spaces, you know, talking about their contributions to their respective countries. Okay, okay so then when we look at rich diasporic places like Washington DC and New York City, which have large um, African diaspora groups from Africa, from the Caribbean, um, from Latin and South America. So these places offer Africans the, um, the ability to congregate and build community with one another. And they also provide access to valued institutions and structures, as well as resources to create a sense of home and belonging. This itself is, an, is a privilege, like get, you know, the opportunity to live in these cities for Africans is a, is a sense of privilege because it allows them to engage their various identities without necessarily having to repress it or postpone aspects of their identities. Say if they lived in a rural American town where there's not much diversity or people who they can relate to or connect with. The cities also confront diaspora Africans with other challenges like racial, ethnic, gender, national, and religious boundaries. And so they're confronted with all these issues from their own, their own communities, like people who are, who are from their own countries, as well as from people who belong to their same racial category, from African Americans, from people of Caribbean descent. And they're also confronted with these questions from white, white Americans. So there is this push-pull force that African immigrants have to deal with coming from all different sides. Um, so a lot of times we understand immigrants to be constantly in a state of identity crisis. We, we understand them to be like um, not really belonging anywhere, that they're always trying to figure out where they belong or don't belong. And a lot of times we, look, we, we understand the space as like something that produces anxiety and that's uncomfortable. And just, we don't, we have a, we tend to put a very negative spin on the space. But um, the younger generation of Africans is changing this conversation. They're saying that this space is actually a good place to be. Um, it's no longer, um, it, no, it no longer produces like negative anxiety. It's actually 
a good place to be because it, it, it provides access to different communities. Um, and it allows people to fully express different aspects of themselves without necessarily having to align themselves with one group or one ideology. But it allows them to express um, their different interests and passions. OK. So I wanted to share a, a quote by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. She recently gave a talk in Nairobi, Kenya to a room full of African artists and writers. And she talked about this concept of ambivalence. And she said that um, Africans today enjoy the luxury of ambivalence in our identities and the work that we choose to pursue and in the way that we express ourselves. And she says that the way that we can enjoy this luxury today is thanks to the people who came before us who didn't have that option, who had to conform to certain boundaries and who had to fit in you know, to certain places. But because they constantly push back against these lines, today we, we have a greater space to express ourselves. Um, and I also think that Ed Edwidge Dante Counts, who's a Haitian American author and writer, she also talks about this idea of, she, I'll just read you her quote. She says that the idea of this great anguish of living between two worlds has diminished somewhat for many immigrant people, artists, and non-artists alike. Not that there is not some uneasiness, but it is no longer the single most urgent anxiety of every immigrant's life. And honestly, maybe it never was, except perhaps in literature. So she's basically saying that we need to move away from you know, reducing immigrant struggles to their identities. You know, they have bigger issues to deal with, but not only that, but this idea of not belonging or not fitting into these neat little boxes is not as problematic as as we think it is, and it can actually, we can actually use it um, for a better good. We can actually use it, we can actually like look at it in a different way and use it to our advantage. So people like Edwidge Dantika and Chimamanda through their writing are reshaping the way we think about these identity struggles. And I wanted to use an example, like a real life example of how young Africans are redefining what it means to be an African, you know, from different parts of the continent, they're um, confronting like these one-dimensional ideas of what it means to belong to those communities. And there's a, blo a Nigerian blogger, um, she uses the name Spectra, Spectra Speaks, and she's a writer. Um, she, she recently wrote an article titled, What Kind of African Doesn't Speak Any African Languages? Me. And so in the article, it's like a personal piece where she says that you know, she doesn't speak any African language. She grew up in Nigeria, and she moved to the United States to attend college, and she's been establishing her career here. But um, so she addresses the assumption that um, African, the judgments that Africans make on other Africans who may not speak, speak their language or know how to cook their traditional foods or dress a certain way, you know, there are a lot of these judgments that are made. And so she's saying that instead of passing judgments, we should first like listen to that person and understand their experience, their social cultural experience, how they were raised, where they were raised. All these factors produce the person that you see today. And so instead of um, pointing and saying, oh, you're not Nigerian enough, or you're not Kenyan enough, or why don't you do this? Why don't you do this like me? You know, this is what it means to belong to my community. And because you don't fulfill those requirements, you don't belong to my community. Instead of saying that, she says it's, it's more productive to listen to each other's experiences and stories and learn from them and respect what that person envisions for their future, you know? Because ultimately, it's a personal decision. Sorry, I'm not moving to the slides. Um, on the top. Oh. Okay. Well, I just want to end with, um, I've been using a, a lot of store hall in my work, a lot of diaspora theory, and the main one is uh, Paul Tiambezeleza, who's African diaspora scholar. And his ideas about diaspora are very useful to this research, because 
He says that, I'll read you the quote again, diaspora is simultaneously a state of being and a process of becoming, a kind of voyage that encompasses the possibility of never arriving or returning, a navigation of multiple belongings. So with this, with this in mind, um, it is clear that we're moving toward a generation and a time where identity crises are not necessarily crises. They're something that we can use to our advantage and something that we can use to create notions of what it means to be African. Thank you. What did you say, Malcolm X? And Winston Hubert, Hubert McIntosh, who called himself Peter Tosh, in the making of black history. Where our task is to unravel the relationship between the two. And in doing that, we are going to explore or, or explore the autobiographies on them or by them, and biographies, critical essays, interviews, speeches, and lyrics by Peter Tosh. One thing peculiar to their leadership was that both of them lived at different times and at different climes in black history. But they had similar contributions, militancy, in the settlement of the black problem. Malcolm X and Peter Tosh were not eminent personalities in the sense that they were products of the ghetto culture in Harlem, here in the United States, and French town in Jamaica. We are so familiar with Bob Marley's, well, one of his songs, French, French Town Rock. It symbolizes the effect of poverty and alienation on the black populace. So when Malcolm X became a black leader, or in his metamorphosis of becoming a black leader, he, he, lead, he led a life of criminality, which we all know, ending up in the prisons. But one thing happened, that in prisons, this young man who dropped out of school at the right grade, decided to improve himself educationally. According to him, the first thing he did was to take time and copy the dictionary from the beginning to the end. That was the first thing he did. And in doing that, he also read books upon books on African history, on economy, on religion, on politics. And all these things exposed him within the realm of the black predicament. And Peter Tosh himself, by the time he came in contact with Bob Marley and Boniwela in their band, the Wellers, they began to address the whole question of colonial <coughs> and post-colonial problem in Jamaica <coughs> through, their, through their music. Therefore, in 1976, when Bob and Peter Tosh <coughs> became a solo artist with his band, World Sound and Power, he had a number of albums, like Legalize It, which was called the Mandibana Anthem, Equal Rights, Mama Africa, <coughs> and so on and so forth. Then, Malcolm X, there were two phases in his leadership between 1952, when he was released from prison, and this is a threat, when he was in the Nation of Islam. And between 1963 and 1965, when he, when he was assassinated, he was also a leader of Organization of African American Unity, as well as the Muslim Mosque Inc. One thing with Malcolm S was that when the period, the first phase, his activities were so restricted, they were based on the influence of his leader, Elijah Muhammad, who taught him about the importance of religion towards black redemption. Malcolm X became an effective speaker 
in America. In fact, he went as far as saying that that apart from a uh, uh, Barry Goldwater in United States in the United States, he was the second best speaker in American um, American politics and history. He that period he used it to be campaigning for separation, black separation from America, claiming that Ameri American blacks were 20 million strong and they needed to leave the white American society and find, found a new state within American shores, claiming that they were in the wilderness of North America. He categorized some Af other Afri um, African American leaders, such like um, Martin Luther King, calling their approach, approaches to, to the black <laughs> predicament as sacred show. At the stage, he asked them that he could not understand why an American black should go about, you know, trying to ask for freedom from the same persons that had, um, had, had kept him in bondage for many years, for many centuries. He was talking about, while making that statement, he was talking about the march on Washington that took place in 1963 when Martin Luther King made his famous speech, I Have a Dream, where the white and blacks moved together, contrary to what the planners had done. So the second phase was by the time he was expelled from the Nation of Islam because of the comment he made about the assassination of President Kennedy. He called it that it was a question of the chickens coming home to roost. So because of that, Elijah Muhammad expelled him and Malcolm X began to reappraise his position as a black leader. First of all, he went on pilgrimage. And in the pilgrimage, he became a new man. His philosophy changed. He now discovered that those whites he had been calling white devils were not devils at, at all. That Islam taught him reintegration. So there, it was in the Holy Land he wrote a letter to the American press. He called it a letter, to, a letter from Mecca, in which he claimed, he said, America needs to understand Islam because this is the only religion that erases from its society the race problem. Talking about how he had stayed with brown, black, red, white um, Muslims in the Holy Land. <laughs> and at the end of the day, slept with them, ate the same food, and his philosophy changed. He now came back and began, began to reappraise his position as a black leader. That was the time he, he formed the organization of African-American unity. And while he was coming back, his his, 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 his concept of black separatism in America changed. He began to think of integration. He began to, he began, he began to think about Pan-Africanism. In fact, he went to the University of Ibarra, <coughs> where he met somebody like, um, he met a lot of people, including Professor E.U. Esenodom, who had already written a book on black Muslims. And there, at Ibarra, he talked about Pan-Africanism. Well, his counterpart, Peter Tosh, we know quite well that Peter Tosh lyrics were contributions to history, were contributions to history, um, politics, underdevelopment, slavery, racism, new colonialism, among others. One of his greatest contributions was on Pan-Africanism. And we know that is track when they say, if you don't know where you come from, as long as you are a black man, you are an African. That was a major contribution to Pan-Africanism. He followed it up with other albums like Mama Africa. Mama Africa, if you see him being drawn on that album, you see him embracing Africa, holding Africa like a, like a child-mother relationship. Talking about the mother he has not seen, but he has been feeling the mother for a long time. Now, he went further to talk about the influence of Marcus Gade and Fan Fanon on his career. In fact, we are told that he was always reading The Wretched of the Earth and Black Skin's White Mask. 
And that was why, at the end of the day, some of his lyrics had commitment to this black struggle. He talked about using music for liberation. We know he's an uh, apartheid. We're going to fight, fight against apartheid. As well as another one, um, recruiting soldiers in his album, Mystic Man. At the height of his career, he began to see his lyrics as messages to the oppressed globally. You know what he said? I like the way things work out irrespective of the humiliation. He's talking about a, a black humiliation. Because after humiliation is power and majesty. And every day, I get the expression to write some exclusive tunes the world will have to listen to. And I don't mean just black people, but everyone who is oppressed. On his leadership, this is what he said. I don't, look I don't look at myself as a singer. I look at myself as a missionary who comes to preach and to teach and to awaken the slumbering mentality of black people. To teach the people what is right from wrong. So some people began to assess him. They said within this contest, because Touch was seen as the most fearless revolutionary artist of his time. Because he was more articulated than his contemporaries, like even more articulated than Bob Marley, more militant than him. He described his Equal Rights album as a message against colonialism, imperialism, exploitation, victimization, here, there, and everywhere. So in conclusion, we can now say that Peter Tosh and Malcolm X, who are the two central figures in this essay, exhibited much leadership qualities within their organizations, such as reggae, Rastafarianism, um, Nation of Islam, as well as Organization of uh, American Unity, uh, African American Unity. In assessing um, Malcolm X from this perspective, one of his major biographers, it's a current work, Manny Marabel, he called the, he called the book um, Malcolm X, A Life of Reinvention. He described him as America's strongest voice for black nationalism. Stressing that Malcolm X never read history, but he was but um, Malcolm X exclusively read history, but he was never a historian. His interpretation of enslavement in the United States and black culture as utterly decimated by the institution of slavery and frames slavery circumstances in America as the very worst forms of racial oppression. For Malcolm X, the strategic pursuit of Pan-African Pan and Third World empowerment meant addressing new constituencies who look to him for inspiration and black leadership. Somebody asked him, because of his oratory, somebody asked him, please, what was your alma mater? Malcolm X replied, books. <laughs> <laughs> because he never went to school. <laughs> Peter Tosh was described as a knight. Excuse me. As an African knight who <coughs> came to do war with his words and his band, and as, 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 as a poet of the utterance. You have not even done the question and this one you are still presenting? <laughs> yeah. We still have one other presenter. It, OK. For that one other presenter, who is this person? We will schedule you for tomorrow. Okay. Okay. And um, we will abolish the question and answer, because wow. we must leave here to, at, in two minutes. Okay. Yes. So what happens is our contract for this room ends 5.15 okay. and they automatically lock this door. Hold on from a central location. Okay. <laughs> so hold on, So finish. When are you? Just, just a minute. In Nigeria, from Muslim to In conclusion, go ahead. Okay. Okay. The activities. In, okay. In conclusion, in conclusion, the activities of my, um, Peter Tosh and Malcolm S were quite interwoven. Thank you.
Sí, sí, sí. 